Oh my goodness me. Oh, Donna. And Doug, look who's here. Donna's here. Hello. Oh, and good morning, Maeve. Oh, Donna. Oh, I've missed you so. So very, very late. Good evening, my darling. How are you going? I'm very well, thank you. I just passed ethics today. I got the email. So well, can I just say we'll be so we'll, we'll share that all together as a family, Donna. That's tremendous. And so, I mean, obviously, it's just an incredible feeling when you pass through ethics like that. My goodness me. Um, how much did you get through? Because obviously so many of the family members who watched this asynchronous, asynchronously have followed the journey, Donna. Um, how much did you get through of what you wanted to get through in the process? Um, I think there were... Yeah, I think there were some compromises had to be made along the way. Um, having said that, I'm happy enough at the end up. Um, I they they were very concerned about um my approach publicity wise, how I would raise awareness of you know the request for participants, yes. and they were really worried, Tara that I was going to end up with too many people and that, you know, they're managing that disappointment. Whereas, to be honest, where I sit, um, well, we'll see how it plays out. But I honestly, my worry would be getting people to... <laughs> my fear is not getting enough people, you know, not enough per participants. Oh, Donna, Donna, well, look, I'm thrilled. So so just a couple of things from, from your old mate. Firstly, just, just log the the disappointments and the deals you had to make to, to get this through. Put that in the thesis itself, Angel. Obviously, put the ethics clearance as an appendix. But the journey through ethics, I don't think students talk about that enough. Doug, we're, we're going to be talking about that next week, the importance of actually speaking how you got it through, strengths, weaknesses, and how the data set you were hoping to get has been truncated by the decisions that you've made. Uh, and the, the, the second thing is, you're, you're absolutely right. You never know how many people are going to be involved in this. You, you never know. Mo most of you know, remember my beautiful, hello, Kyles, the Red Queen's here. Um, so most of you know my wonderful student, former student, Dr. Alyssa Armstrong. She was looking at women and, uh, and, and Dungeons and Dragons. Now, Donna... You'd think you get about five people and a banana to that, to be frank with you. You're doing this serious, important work. And Alyssa, you know, she wasn't too bothered. She was pretty laid back, our Alyssa. And she got 96,000 res responses to her survey. Uh, and and it's it's surprising, of course. Beautiful Piper's had a huge number of responses as well. So so Donnie, and you just but you just can't pick it. You just can't pick it. So it's not that the committee made this decision and you made this decision. None of us know. So so they're the only comments I'd make. G'day, Josh. Donna's got her ethics through, mate. Just congratulations, Donna. Oh my goodness. Thank oh, you so much. Huge news. Huge news. And, and and Donna, also think about writing that as a self-standing piece too, mate. As I've said all the way along, g'day, Loza. Hey, Loza. Um, Don, Donna's got her ethics through. That's, we're just going to put that on a T-shirt through the rest of the day, Lauren. <laughs> um, so, 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 darling, one, I'd be writing through the process too because it's so politically hot. They're worried, I think, Angel, that you are going to get so many and it's going to open, I'm going to use the dreadful cliche, the can of worms and out it all comes again. How are you going to manage that if that does happen, Donna? If, if too many people respond, um, I'm just hoping that the criteria, if that's applied fairly, that, um, um, that if I act swiftly in terms of once I reach a working threshold, that I, I remove it from the, the website and, and, you know, act swiftly. But that said, if there was a you know, an absolute deluge of people like, gosh, you'd have to obviously respond to everybody and be yeah. um, civil, but you couldn't possibly begin to interview all of them. So you'd have to look at at your criteria and the threshold and revising that. But 
Awesome. I honestly don't think that'll happen, Tara. I think I'll have the opposite problem. I don't think I'll get enough people, but look, maybe that's me being worried. Yeah, look, I think I think you will. I think you will get certainly enough people. The only advice I'd offer host Piper and, and Dr. Alyssa is just w when the survey's out, you won't have great sleep. So every couple of hours, just monitor the figures because it's all calm, it's all calm. And then suddenly there's this scary, you know, it's put on a group and then suddenly the numbers jump, right? So just just watch it judiciously, particularly for the first four days. Just just keep it, and you'll know how we're travelling, you know, certainly at the end of the week, all right? Oh, Donna, isn't this brilliant, Kyles? So, Kyles, you're looking great. I really see, I'm seeing you in green. I'm seeing Gay and Lorraine in a purple. Is that a purple, right? Oh, hello. Sorry, I was muted. No, 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 this is blue. This is for Help for Heroes. Um, it's a British charity that support veterans in counselling and whatever, and they have a whole website with clothing. They do similar ones in Australia, but every now and again, I a shipment of uh, the British uh, Help for Heroes. So, yeah, I just I, I, I really it. like that. And <laughs> you, you've enhanced my life this week, as you always do, the rain. I've I've gone back to my jam soundtrack. So I've gone back to uh, Paul Weller, and it's been a it's been a great week, mate. Town called Malice. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we we yeah, it was fantastic. I was so tired, but you've got to go, and you? you've got to have a life outside PhD. That's been my mistake. Unbelievable. So, Lorraine, we're going to come back to you. And, of course, I need to thank you. I didn't have a chance to thank you last week. Thank you for getting up so damn early and coming to that gig last Friday. You were a bugger, but you <laughs> opened my heart when I saw you. My heart, like, exploded out of my body. So thank you for getting there. Thank you. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. It was really, genuinely, it was so such a good presentation. It was so, you know, on your every word listening oh, to you no. it's really really useful really good thank but you we, but Lorraine I'm thrilled you're here because we did actually get some feedback to talk about you know from the Brains Trust about failure and how people manage failure and then of course Kylie posted the rock this morning uh so that changed my life so good morning Kylie um we will go to everybody's questions we'll start with everybody's questions first but Kylie maybe we'll start with failure because that was the that was the I, I thought you would like that one when I saw it this morning I thought I'll share it before our catch-up um, basically, for those that haven't seen it yet, it's The Rock talking about that he got to America to play his first, I think it's NBL, NBA, the football one. Football. I'm so up with sports. Um, and got dropped. Six days later, got sent back home to Canada. And he was devastated because all he wanted to do was to play, I think it was the Super Bowl, the big, big one. But he looked back now and he's like, sometimes that failure is there to push you in where you should be. And he's a much bigger person and superstar than he ever could have been but he doesn't know that failure was meant for him until later. So sometimes the universe, again, we're going to go all hippie, Dara, very early. Um, sometimes the universe will push you in a direction you don't think you should be going in, but you know what? At the end, it's worthwhile. Now, Carl, we're going to just pause here for a moment because I've had a few of those weird moments this week. Um, you know, and as an old goth, I just go, this is just rubbish. This is just rubbish. Mm -hmm. But, but Carl, there, there is, you know, it comes from Oprah, I think, or does it come from <laughs> Mayor Angelo? Originally, Mayor Angelo wrote it up. That I, if, if you're not in the direction that you're meant to be, firstly, a pebble hits your head and then a rock <laughs> and then a large stone and then a bloody boulder lands on your entire body and you're flattened because you're going in the right direction. And when you just give yourself the, yeah. the, the ability to go in a different direction, weird, interesting, positive things mm. start happening. So I, I know I look back on my career and I had a moment where I was living in Brisbane at the time. I had the opportunity to move to a promotion in either Warwick or Toowoomba and I moved back to Warwick because well, that was my safe spot. Three years later, I'm in Toowoomba, couldn't look back, love the place. So was that the universe going, <laughs> you chose the wrong way, but you're going back that way but what's interesting, Carl, and your career really does show this, is when you, and I wouldn't say a misstep, but you just make a decision mm. and maybe the other but maybe the other decision was better. But, you know, mm. by the way, I'm recording a video at the moment about how we think about decisions and resulting. Too often we judge a decision by the outcome and actually you don't mm. know that, you sad bugger, right? No. So just un be kind to yourself, right? Mm. But, 
but Carl, have you found that in your career? Obviously, you're impossibly young, but in terms of the decision making and the determinations, a, a bad decision doesn't always ruin your life. Doesn't mostly ruin your life. No, no. Um, and again, I won't go into details of one major decision, a relationship that at the time devastated. Didn't think it was. I thought that was where my life was going, and couldn't be happier now. I, and again, I wouldn't have known that then. I don't think it's until you get that maturity and you get further down the track that you can sit back and go, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, because that's how I teach it when I'm um, doing death all the work, actually, is that when a death happens, your entire life is covered by the death, right? So mm. there's no life outside of the death. But you've just got to encourage people to sort of get up in the morning, try and have a shower. You know, personal hygiene is pretty tough in the yeah. you know, week, months after. So just keep walking, keep breathing. Um, and what gently happens minute upon minute is the life starts to get just a little bit larger than the death. Mm. And the longer you can survive, the more of life you have outside of the lens of death right yeah the death and that color starts to come back into the world that's right but the death itself doesn't doesn't reduce in size that's why mm. I tell people it's like you don't yeah. get round grief the death doesn't lessen mm. in, in its size but what happens is your life gets bigger than the death because you can yeah. but you know yeah. you can't pour people right in the middle of it i try and draw them <gasps> oh and yeah no and it, but it does, I suppose, give them hope. Just breathe. So actually, live mm. in the day. The next day is important. Yeah, and just take that next step, next step, next step. And it might you might not think you're doing much in each of those steps, but a lot of steps add up. And and I think with death, but I think with everything that you might be struggling with in your life, it's that day again. I reach out to Doug. It's just take that next step. Take that next step. You might bang up against the wall, but just take that next step. It's plotting. My mother has always taught me just to keep plotting. Yeah, momentum <laughs> has a purpose in and of itself, Kyle. Momentum in and of itself. Straight to beautiful gay who I hope is wearing purple or my eyes are really, really going through a journey. Don't tell me that's blue, gay. Am I, am I eyes? Uh, purple, it's very, very purple. <laughs> now, where are you on this, gay, about failure and decisions and stuff? Uh, well, you were talking about um, death. Oh, I always talk about death. Yeah, I was talking about um, changes in life. Well, the 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 um, the advice that you would give you give to people who are dealing with a death is the same for people who are dealing with a different kind of death. That the, like the kind of trauma that I've been through late last year, which is still yeah. ongoing. It is exactly that. It's a little death. It's um. You, you take it one step at a time. You get out. The first thing you do every day is you get out of bed. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm lucky I have dogs that rely on me, so I have to get out of bed. I have to feed the dogs, and then when I've fed the dogs, well, maybe I should feed myself. Um, yeah. And it is exactly that. You do one bit at a time, yeah. After, you know, step by step by step, and it does eventually. Life does get larger, does get better. You can, your brain starts to work again. Yeah. And it, it's the same thing when you've finished a huge project like a PhD. Yeah. You, you suddenly got that part of your life is over yeah. and you don't know what to do with yourself. Yeah. And you take it one. What did I do when I finished my PhD? The first thing I got home after I had delivered the hard copies to the office. I got home, yeah. didn't have a clue what to do with myself, right. so I read somebody else's thesis. Oh, yeah. How sad is that? No, it's tremendous, but also you're a wonderful editor. But, Gay, as we've often talked about, mate, and Jess, this is important too, we'll get your professional expertise on this, and good morning, Jess, good morning, Shell, uh, is that students do behave, and I'll say oddly, but, of course, it's not odd because the PhD in itself is such an aberrant data point in life. But when students hand in a thesis, really weird behaviours occur. You know, I've, I've had more students than I can count that sort of come into the office and sort of crumble, like we end up sort of on the floor and they're sort of crying like the, you know, the Oprah cry, the on the floor they haven't actually got the the human breath capacity to be able to stand and it's because it's over but also I think Jess 
students are expecting sort of like a band to play around them. They're expecting fireworks to explode. You know, the, exactly. See, Lorraine, they're after a trombone. They're assuming that someone with a trombone will be following them until the day of their death, right, post the thesis. And, of course, they submit it and life goes on. And of course, they then got this sort of pent up thing waiting for the examination to occur and on and on we go. So, so, but the behavior is very strange. Some get very angry. I had a, I had an angry, I had an angry uh, submitter just before uh, digital office hours today. It was almost angry that, that, that they were submitting because they were forced to submit. And I'm going, right, right. Yeah, so 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 I've you know cared for that particular student and wished them well and given them sort of sort of milestone strategies to do dissemination and stuff. So while the thesis is being examined, focus on these things. But it is interesting, Jess, that it's such an extreme moment in life, and of course only one percent of the world's population have a PhD, that you haven't got primary or secondary socialization support except digital office hours to help you work out what that trajectory looks like. It's weird, Jess. Yeah, yeah, and I'll just be up front. Uh, professional psychologist Jess hasn't come to the meeting today. Yes. Um, I'm in it with Kylie. I'm sorry, Kylie, I missed the beginning, but I'm totally in it. And I wrote down what you just said, Tara, one bad decision cannot ruin your life because I'm sitting in that at the moment, that where you've done something stupid and then there's all these consequences and you're an adult and you should know better. And you just get swept up in the moment. You're like, oh, yeah, I'll do that and I'll do that. And then you're stuck with this massive big load and you're like, crap. And I did this. I've only got myself to blame. Um, and, oh, my neighbour's fixing his fence outside. So that's really helpful for our meeting. That's the week I'm having. I was trying to have a meeting yesterday and he decided he would with a snip. Um, you know, oh, look, I, I love a handy neighbour. Oh, I think that's great. A little bit of fence work. Don't worry about it, Jess. I think I've ever seen him before this week. No, no. Yeah, she's um, worker as I have never seen him. But I'm totally in it with Kylie and with other people. I think it might just be, I don't know, maybe something's happening to the collective right now where we're all just being forced to pull, put on our big girl pants and big boy pants. And, and includes Doug. And <laughs> run into the storm and weather it. Yeah. So, Jess, my, my, my argument, and it's the craziest thing, Jess, because as I said, I'm, I'm currently learning the vlog to record next Wednesday on, I think I've called, like, making bad decisions or making difficult decisions, right? So it's the weirdest right. thing. But, darling, it's because it's late capitalism, our organisations are toxic and bullying. And so all of us, are, and pretty bright people, are having to make decisions selecting between bad decisions, so this is an incredibly tough thing in life nice. where, yeah, I, I'm with you, sister. And so there's 15 choices that you've got to make. All of them are bad. All of them are substandard rubbish decisions, all of them. So there's no, you know, there's no lottery win. There's no white knight. There's no luck. Um, it's just a series of pretty crappy decisions and we have to, and of course, just because we've been told from our parents and all the sort of stuff that, you know, happy ending and joy and light and all the rest of it. And of course we're going, well, well, the hero hasn't shown up, mate. The hero yeah, hasn't shown up. I got, I got to 41 believing that. And it's like this year, it's like, oh, crap, no one's coming to save me from this. Yeah. But I, can, can, can I jump, can yes, I jump in? Can Sorry, can Lorraine, I know you, you're being so patient, but I've got to jump in. But why aren't we our own hero? Is it? Yeah. Because like, it's hard. Like, and, yeah. But then you're not relying and, yay, you just, and, and the, like you were saying about the trumpets after the PhD, I remember after my last exam for engineering, I walked out, I got in my car and I sat there and I cranked the stereo and I sung in the car park. I, I played my own trumpet. I'm not waiting for someone else to play it. <laughs> See, Carl, you're amazing. But but if you can do that, Carl, that's, that's tremendous. If you can be your own hero, it makes a real difference. Uh, but it's really hard to do if you just get pushed down and pushed down and pushed down and pushed down. And, Jess, before we go to Beautiful Lorraine and to our gay, if it if it helps, Jess, my entire life, I'm 55, I'll be dead soon. My, if, if I had to list the catastrophically stupid mistakes I've made in my life, in fact, if I was to try and list any good decisions I've, I've made, I'd be battling to list good decisions, Jess. In fact, I've probably only got two. I was lucky that I married 
the right man twice, right? That's the only luck or good decision that I've made, right? The rest of them, is, it's been a bloody shambles, Jess. Shambles, mate. I think because, because we're in this, you know, this group of, you know, the really, really smart people, you think that you should know better. Like, you oh. know, I'm doing a PhD and you... Mate, I can't manage a grocery shop, mate. I can't manage around. a grocery shop. Nah, got no idea what's going on most of the time, mate. Honestly. Actual life. Okay. Right. Yeah. So we've we've got beautiful gay, and then we're going to go to the rain. Gay, can I go to the rain first? Because I think she might have put a hand up first. So let's go to the rain and then to beautiful gay. Go. Thank you. I'm in no rush though. Um, I was just gonna say I've always lived by the worst decision is no decision. Just make a decision, even if you reflect after and go, oh, I could have done that better. You made a decision, you took ownership, you ran with it. Um, but I just wanted to come back to that failure. I had a conversation with my husband a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, and he's he's such a sensible person to run. He really calms me down. Um, and he said to me, you know, what's the uh, criteria for passing or not passing PhD? So I explained it to him. He said, you know, you've got your straight pass or your minor corrections, your major corrections, or you fail. And he said, well, what will you do if you fail? And I said, well, that that isn't an option. Um, so he said, well, what are you aiming for? So I said, I'm probably going between major, minor corrections I'd like, but look, major I can accept. So he said, well, how will you feel? I said, I won't have time for feelings because I'll be reading their comments and getting that thing damn well resubmitted to make sure it passes. I will not spend any time on um, self-defeating in a negative chat and that can come later when it gets passed. So, yeah, I just um, wanted to share that um, keep your expectations realistic because then if you don't, you know, with some movement, if you don't get, you know, the glory straight away, that's not the end of the world. Just read the comments, learn from that, and then, you know, I fully expect that to happen. So, you know, if it's if I fail, I mean, I'll be a mess and I'll be here for you lot to mock me up, but <laughs> that is not an option. That is not. But, but also it's not statistically probable. And beautiful John's in. We love you, John. And, of course, John's about to go into examination, so hashtag no pressure, brother. But just, you know, understanding the sociology of this, I think, is helpful. So 1% of PhDs fail, 1%. Are you bright? Are you in the top ninety nine percent of students? Have you got a sock? Have you done some reading? Is it well written? In out, shake it all about. Thanks, everybody. About ten percent, depending on some systems, ten to twelve percent get sort of caught in that revise and resubmit to what we call a four or a D. So they have to make corrections and go through examination again. But that means about eighty five percent go through as a straight through, which is about four to six percent to a minor correction to a major correction so if you just sort of just hang in there do a Kylie keep moving keep momentum then you go, you're going to be absolutely fine so the the challenge in the doctorate Lorraine made is that people are trit so why it's such a difficult degree is not that people fail at the end but because they don't finish if you finish you got a bloody fighting chance of doing good eh Rock and roll. Gay and then the beautiful Jess. Talk to us, beautiful gay. Jess was talking about, I'm an adult, I feel like I should know better. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Since I got my PhD, I've been thinking, when I, when I don't do something well or I don't, things aren't working out right, I, I keep thinking to myself, I've got a PhD, I should be better than this. Yeah. But... An idiot with a PhD is still an idiot. Yep. You don't change yourself no. when you get a PhD. No. Just because you're an adult doesn't mean you're going to get everything right. Just because you got a PhD doesn't mean you're going to get fantastic marks and become a world changer. No. It's just the nature of and it's a, and it's a degree. The other thing I think people they make it sort of everything. They make it the the sort of you know light at the end of the tunnel. Let's use another bloody cliche, but it's my whole world. That's a mistake. You've always it's, got to say it's a degree, team. It's a degree. It starts and it finishes. 
it is it is learning how to be a researcher and it is showing that you can do research it doesn't mean it's going to be the best thing you've ever done in your life it won't be the best thing you've done in your life it's rubbish it's the it's the worst research you'll ever do it's the worst It'll be the worst thing you've done in your life. So once you've got the degree, you have shown your peers that you can do it, and then you go. It's, it's like learning to drive. When you when you get your driver's – when I got my driver's licence, the examiner said to me, yes, you've passed. Now go out and learn how to drive. Yeah. And can I say I learned to drive at 18 and I still can't drive, okay? I still can't drive. <laughs> uh, if, if someone said to me, we will, we will kill you, if you can't do this reverse part, I would be dead, okay? I would be dead. I picked the area of Western Australia where they do a test and you don't have to parallel park or reverse park. I picked oh, I, at the Warwick Police Station, just so you know it's a real thing for the West Australians on the call, go to Warwick. They're nice coppers. Um, but, Gay, that's right. So it's yeah. it, it's iterative. So well done, Gay. So we'll go to Jess and then beautiful mate. Jess, talk to us, beautiful one. I was just going to say, throw something in that actually has been helping me and take it or leave it, but one of my mentors told me last week um, to switch out the word. So I've been talking about my problem, my challenge, my difficulty, um, and he said, um, what happens if you switch those words to experience? Yeah. If you're having an experience. What are you going to do about this experience? Yeah. I'm like, Okay. When I reconceptualize it like that, I can go, okay, I can see how I might look back at this later and go, oh, that was an experience. Yeah, and wow. and you're right, Jess, the re-languaging is crucial. I had a different area. So whenever I come across a problem, something I can't do, which happens all the time, right? So every day I go, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I used to sort of sit in a panic with that. So, you know, deficit model. And now... I force myself, and now I don't even have to think about it. I say, this is a moment for learning. This is great. I didn't know this. I'm going to ask a clever person, and I'm going to learn something today. And what a gift that a human being at 55 is able to learn something. What a blessing. And that's that's changed how I think about I no longer am in deficit. I'm in a learning model. See if it's of use. But let's go to beautiful Maeve and then to Josh. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi, Tara. Um, so I have a question that's at a tangent to this discussion, but I can feel this discussion. It could take the whole session. So, <laughs> so I've got my hand up so I can throw this in. Um, it's I have six days to go to submit for my milestone. Yes. So I'm no pressure. Hashtag no pressure. No pressure at all. So um, my question is... I have these, I'm doing my sonics chapter and I have these voice files. So there's about 10 of them and I took them on what I'm calling a research excursion, which is where I went to King's Cross where my novel is set and walked around the cross. I was with my daughter. So some of the voice files are her and I having a cocktail opposite a bar that's part of my novel. <laughs> and, but we're, we're having... A very big chat about the 70s, what's changed, what, how am I feeling, what do I like? So there's yeah. a lot in there and yeah. some of them are like an hour but some of them are like five, ten minutes. Um, and it's mostly, it's very related to the novel, so it's very sort of artefact exegesis connections. Yeah. And I'm wondering would I consider, and I'm very keen on Hive Mind if they've dealt with anything similar, um, I'm wondering, is there a way in which I could call that data? Or I'm wondering, like, what kind of options, Tara, in particular, you might think of the way to deploy the sonic files? Yes. I'm going to end up putting them all in a, um accessible appendix. But before they're in an appendix, I want to use them in the chapter. Yes. See, why, how can they play out in the chapter? Yes, and look, May, that's brilliant. We've got I've got notes there, and we'll come straight back to that, noting that Doug and podcasting was also one of the requests for today as well. So Great. we'll have a sonic moment in about two minutes, but I'd imagine Josh was just finishing off the failure. This is a disaster. This is a debacle conversation. And g'day, Liam. Good evening, sir. Um, so, Josh, brother, where are you on sort of the Jess, Tara, I feel like rubbish conversation? It's definitely been the week for it, I think. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of it as well. And um, I guess the big thing that's helped me sort of snap out of the melancholy has been the, um, you know, putting the hypothetical situation to yourself or what would you be doing if you didn't make this decision that you need to make? Um, which I know was one of your vlogs ages ago, what would you do if you weren't doing this PhD, which was great at the time. Um, so for me, when I moved to Taiwan, I had always planned to directly apply for entry-level academic posts and not go for a postdoc. After my experiences of supervision, um, I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't put myself in the hands of another PI, <laughs> lab head, etc. cetera. Um, and I felt confident enough that I would be able to get across that bridge. Um, but to be honest with you, it's, you know, I've been in precarious employment now for um, over a year in another country without constant work, working from home. And I'm just so over it. Um, and so I was having a conversation with my husband and he just said to me, you know, would it be worse than what it is right now? And and that immediately, you know, fixed things. So <laughs> immediately had a look at a bunch of postdoc opportunities, heaps of them there. And as Kylie said, when you, you know, sometimes it's for the right direction. I found some great looking ones out there that are on things that would really stretch me that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So yeah, it's just, I think that's a great thing to do is to think about what the alternative is. Yeah. Um, if that didn't happen. And usually it would be worse. And look, I agree with that. And also I'd say, Josh, and again, weirdly, this is the research I did for the gig I'm doing next week, is we all have this stuff about our gut reaction, our emotions, our vibe. And particularly when we're in a downcast, we're in a bad situation. And a lot of us are in an absolutely bloody catastrophic situation, right? And so we're not thinking clearly, we're not making great decisions. So we're also not gathering data and information correctly to be making the right determination. So one thing I always recommend is have a brain trust, trust, and obviously we've got a brain trust here, but have your trusted mates. You've met the wonderful Jackie Hewitt. I don't basically breathe or go to the shops without talking to Jackie Hewitt. Uh, and so you've got these really bright people around you to check your logic to to say, right, you've got this data set, you are aware there's 57 other data sets that you've completely ignored or you don't know about. So having the people around you to offer that triangulated check and verification, because we make decisions within our wheelhouse and our lens, where's beautiful Jess, we were talking about it yesterday. So from our lens, from our particular vista, right? And so having those alternative voices around you are really useful, Josh. And look, Josh, yeah, you know, there is no gold in them, they're hills, mate. And the problem is, you know, postdocs become postdocs become permadocs. Um, we've all got these transitory teaching experiences that are deeply unpleasant, horrific, paid very little, unstable just catastrophic, just getting, and Liam will talk to you in one second. I can, I feel your pain, brother, getting the maddest responses from people, email upon email upon email, expectation, expectation, and we end up sort of working 24 seven. So th there's no, there's no blessing. There's no great situation available for us. It's if we can just manage to find the good in the bad situation for 40 years. Liam, brother, talk to me and talk to Josh. Oh, um, the, the sympathies um, I come in here, Josh. You know, we, we speak over um, Fabulous the Cat. That's our bonding point at the moment, isn't it, Josh? Um, Josh's cat. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, I could have the life of Fabulous the Cat um, because it is so much more pleasant than okay. academic life at the moment okay. um <laughs> anyway <laughs> um yeah i'm i'm in my second post which is open-ended um and i don't want to romanticize it because uk higher education is brutal people are managed out of the institution on a daily basis um yeah so i've i've come to um, an understanding with that brutality and especially recently when my friend went for a senior lecturer job and then this panel tried to knock my friend down to lecturer yep. um, and there was all sorts of weird 
oddities um, occurring where there was numerous phone calls after the um, interview process where they tried to gauge the person's political views, um, views on academic life, disciplinary related issues um, and interdisciplinary related issues, all sorts. And my friend um, took an empowered decision and told them this week to take a hike. Yes. Um, Yes. and remove themselves from the appointment process. Um, and I'm glad my friend did that. Yeah. Can I, can I say, Liam, uh, the best these institutions are going to treat you is during the appointment process. That's as good as it gets. So if they're asking you about interpersonal relationships, disciplinary issues, money, where you want to live and work, you know, health matters. Once we start to get into this very weird terrain, Liam, uh, that's as good. I mean, you're learning. Remember that old line where people tell you the truth about themselves, believe them? I'm I'm a big supporter of that. Mm -hmm. And if they can't even manage to maintain the Goffman-esque front stage during the appointment process, wow, mate, if they can't even hold it together for four weeks, for four weeks, then my goodness me, what a what a disaster we're heading into. So Liam, I think that's I think that's accurate. But you know it, it was just it was just outrageous. So yeah. they embarrassed themselves as an institution. Yeah. In terms of they for, for my friend, because they was they were making all sorts of kind of commentaries that just wasn't theirs to make. Um phoning up randomly on teams. Um and this is for a senior lecturership. And they'd done this to another friend um, a few weeks earlier, um, who I also know had gone through the appointment process and turned down the job and told me to tell my friend, this is not a goer, or, you know, it is what it is. Um, so you learn quite a lot about the appointment process um, and the weirdness and a second I get a whiff of weirdness. It's like, I'm out of here. Bye-bye. I'm looking for the nearest exit. Um, yeah. See you later. Uh, Liam, I think that's absolutely right. And colleagues, I will share with you, of course, on last Wednesday morning, and the Dugster knows this, I, I uploaded a rather odd uh, outrider on the headhunters because I'd got a lot of requests about, about that very interesting profession. And so I, it's, you know, I've been doing research on it for about 10 years. So I finally came to the table. And can I say that the consequences of that people like have come out of the woodwork and talked about the catastrophic experiences they've gone through uh, with headhunters and employment consultants. So people just don't speak of it because they're frightened, Liam. And it's the fear, how we manage the fear, mate. I don't have an answer to that. Well, it's interesting because this particular institution you did, I am... Um... A number of years ago, you did a guest talk for them for our lovely Alison. And our lovely Alison warned my friend um, not to touch that place with a 10 foot barge pole. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. So, yeah. You should always use your networks, have trusting people around you. And most of us have mates somewhere. So even if Donna doesn't have a mate at a particular institution, if she can contact me, the chances are I have or somebody I know has. Right. And I'll just say on a on a mate's behalf, Martin, I've used Martin because he's a good mate of mine and we've been around a lot. Um, Martin, uh, I've got a mate that's thinking of working at this particular institution. You've been there. Any vibe on that, mate? And Donna, you can discount that data point, but you're better to know it and in full consciousness approach that conversation. Good on you, Liam. Oh, Liam, you're amazing. And when when does our AW finish, by the way? When is she when is she leaving? Um, she's been promoted to associate prof at another institution yes. that has saw a fabulousness. Um, but yeah, it's been announced now, and you know I am devastated. I'm but also very overjoyed for our AW yeah. as well, and I'm sending a lot of love, and I've sent a very kind of rebellious mug to her, um, and I've signed it. You might have saw it on Facebook. I saw the mug. Um, and can I say, for those colleagues that are on a bit of a journey at the moment and having a really bad time, um, 
AW, uh, one of my best friends on planet Earth, uh, had a truly appalling experience at a university and, and was restructured out of the organisation and was in this transitory, temporary, Josh, sort of precariat life for some years. And the story I often tell about people that are living in hotels and doing multiple commutes through multiple jobs, um, that was AW for a large chunk of years, then proceeded to crawl back into a job and then from that job has been able to move to an associate professorship readership in the United Kingdom. So it's it, I, I have such <sighs> admiration doesn't even cut it, Liam. That, that woman's gumption uh, inspires me every single day, mate. But you hang in there. And just one final question before we move to the sound conversation for Maeve and for Duxter. Liam, just for Josh and I in particular, how do you find meaning in the despair? So on the days where, and the days that become the weeks, that become the months, that become the years of, you know, absolute debilitating experiences and behaviours, what do you, what do you, what do you do to find the good in it, mate? I remember what I'm here for that's what I try and do you know who am I here for and you know if you're not feeding yourself you know you always say this Tara if you're not feeding yourself first then what are you doing you know you can't be any of any help or service to anybody else I am um, but I've also got good at pushing back and being good with boundaries and also with with particularly academic managers who for want of a better word take the pp a little bit um and i've got good at pushing back i am um, in a robust way and an evidence-informed way and you know i'll just say thanks for playing um but that that's not an accurate assessment and where's the evidence you know and i think that i've learned that from aw as well from being in a particular workplace so that that's yeah. been good as well good having that ally yes. um yeah <laughs> And and that's the point, Kyle. So obviously, your couple of your former workplaces were this as well of just pure irrationality. So the trouble is, you're trying to make logical, rational, evidentially driven decision making in an irrational, highly ideological environment. And of course, it it, it doesn't go square, doesn't go into circle. No, even more so when you're an irrational thinker, but it's also when you're working in a regulatory sort of environment. Being an engineer, you you've got requirements, protecting the community, um, registered, which is a requirement in Queensland, and if they're playing stupid buggers like they do, you're taking the risk. You're carrying it, and that's why I kept pushing back. And, and I'm, I'm, great to you, Liam. I'm so glad that you pushed back because if they're going to, I hate to use the word, lowball you, but stuff them. You're better than that. It's their loss. Fantastic. Oh, so Jess, Jess, how are you feeling? Are you feeling more more centered and robust in the universe at this juncture, my queen? Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. But I can. I feel like I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna run into it. Um, and I'm not scared. Oh, never I'm be scared. scared. Never be scared. Be robust, Jess. That's helpful. But, but also just probably when you're saying run into it, if it is a wall, mate, I, I would I would be I'd probably be trying to sort of like knock a bit of the brick down like rather than just going boof because I think that would hurt. I'm just going to close my eyes and run at it, Tara. Yeah, that, so you frighten me when you do this, right? Whereas, whereas I sort of sit in front you have of the to wall. Pop out the other side. <laughs> yeah, whereas you know, I sit in front of the wall and I pick at the mortar and I just accidentally knock a couple of bricks off. And and then I graffiti the wall and and you just sort of see the rain's going. This is a documentary of my life, the rain. And so you you just sort of you just sort of suddenly the walls down, get a few elbows in. Thanks, the rain. That's classy, like you are. Come on, girlfriend. And but just if you run at it, you, you're probably going to bounce. So just just look at a brick. Look at, as a favor for me on the weekend. Just find one brick on this wall and go. I don't like that brick. I'm going to hurt that brick. Okay. All right. My usual approach is to find a trampoline and jump over it so I don't even touch the wall. But that's yeah. not working for me this time. Yeah. It's a pretty high wall. <laughs> so, Jess, as, as the ageing crone of the family, let me just say, Donna, don't you laugh, the ageing crone of the family, let me just say to you, the older you get, you sort of, when you're young, you think you can jump over it, but, of course, the problem is that wall keeps coming back, Angel. You think you've jumped over it, and when you reach yeah. a certain age... 
you realize there is no way around or over there is only through yeah it's the same wall just a different color different brick but same wall liam straight in on the wall mate come on Oh, so Tara, like I'm just really interested. So I've followed your career for a long time Shame, um, and you've been really, you know, I take a lot of inspiration. Oh, how do you, how do you manage all this? Basically, there's a soap, there's a soap opera in the UK called Hollyoaks um, and it is like literally like home and away on acid. Yeah. And it sounds like, just, you know, the experiences that you had in Canada, in, you know, in some UK higher education institutions. I just think, how are you still, like, together? Oh, I'm not. You know? I'm not. <laughs> I'm a hollow shell of a human, Liam. No, look, Liam. <laughs> Liam, it's a, great, it's a great question, Liam. And the thing is, what I'd say is, and I was having a wonderful chat with our beautiful Piper who watches this asynchronously on Saturday morning with Aiden, but uh, who's the other of the four horsemen of the zombie apocalypse. And, and Liam, the, the actual, the reason I tell these stories is because it's not about me. This is common. This I know. Is what is happening. And the trouble is people are filled with failure. They're filled with shame. They blame themselves. They don't understand the context. Are you right, John? John's straight in there. John, talk to me, John. Um. I'm surprised in a sense at the, the lack of confidence of people. I, I, Jess seems a great person to me. And wonderful. why, you know, why worry about these stupid shits around you in a sense? Uh, and when we talk about the examiners too, well, they're part of that system. I mean, if they're a, a shit examiner, they're going to give you likely a, a shit thing. It's not necessarily a reflection on you. You know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, a, a stuck up prick, if you like, but I, I don't let them worry me in that sense. I, I'm still um, believe in myself, possibly too much. So I'm if they give you a bad mark or do something, that's a reflection of them often or the system more than it's a reflection of you. Um, so sort of don't don't worry about it so much. You can always go and do something else. This academic world, I don't really want to get into because it does have problems, but it's not the only place that has problems. I've been through the public service and it's the same. People are promoted to their greatest level of incompetency. That's the way it works. It, it does, it is helpful to find a person who can see your value and work as a mentor. That's a really important thing in looking for a way through there. The other thing is go somewhere else and do what you want to do. Um, when I finish my PhD, I'll be hopefully turning it into a book. But then besides a holiday, I'll go back to my artwork or my, my painting, some, something else I know I can do. I'll, I'll try many things. I don't have to get stuck in that groove because I'm I believe I can do it and, and and stuff them if they don't like it. Yeah. Do you ever sort of, I hear the soundtrack whenever John speaks, I believe I can fly. Honestly, I'm just with you. I have these yeah. inspirational songs that follow me through. John, you're unbelievable. So I agree with everything you've said. It's like stuff them. I love that a lot. The only thing I'd say to you putting the Dean hat on, and obviously, you know, I've invested my whole life in higher education and it's hurt me, John. It's hurt me. But I've invested my whole life in the vision of what higher education is. And John, why examiners matter? is because a PhD is about an international standard. So that's why I believe very strongly in examination proper, no conflicts of interest, no randoms, no dilemmates, that you, all of us, must reach this standard because that renders the PhD meaningful. The only reason I'm, I'm in this job, and it's the second time I've been in a dean job, is because if we dumb the doctorate down, we should close our universities down. If, if anything sort of gets through, if no one gives a damn, then the university's over. So this is, I've always described the PhD as the last stand. This is the last stand for the standards in higher education. So that's why I do invest in the examiners. Go, John. 
it's not that I don't give a, an exam and I might uh, give a damn and I might be lucky. I might get fantastic examiners who see the quality of my work. Yeah. If I'm not already convinced with that effort I've put into it and considering what comments I have received, that it isn't at a reasonable level, then why bother with it? I mean, if I'm personally reasonably happy that that's okay, and they, I'll listen to advice and I'll take it on board. But if I think it doesn't follow my standards, if it doesn't, um, you know, live up to what you think is a proper way of looking at things, if it's a bit like my supervisor, principal supervisor, unnamed, who is a real pedant and only worried about whether I've got the commas in the footnotes, um if they're focused on those peripheral tiny things, that's a reflection of them. It's not a reflection of my work. If I get a comment back that says, oh, well, look, you haven't addressed this issue and really it needs the context, that may be valuable, valuable, but I'll judge their input by my own values. As, as you should, John, the only little point I'll put in, the reason why we as assessors, we as supervisors are very pedantic, and I'm I'm one of those people for which I'd like to apologise on behalf of my entire family. The reason I do that for Doug, and I'm very focused, and that's my first sweep, is because if an examiner sees errors in referencing or in style, the moment they see that, you've gone down to a three. So before they've read contact, because they've gone academic literacies are problematic. So that's why it's it's horrible, I know, and students go, why, why is this person doing this? We do it just so the content is given a fair chance. I haven't convinced you. I, my, my job is not to convince you, John, but just to be fabulous. Go, Maeve, darling, talk to us, sweetness. Sorry, I'm desperate for something about Sonics. I'm sorry. Um, and Doug, we have 11 minutes to go. I'll be I'll be very, very quick. It's very, very easy conversation, Maeve. So the trope is the poorest PhD. So every PhD now is a digital PhD, including the wonderful Johns, is a digital PhD. So therefore, it has, whether it is URLs of open access materials, YouTube videos, TikTok videos, tweets. So there is a porous nature of the contemporary PhD. So your references, whether it's footnotes or the bibliography at the end, is very different to how a bibliography or reference list looked five, ten years ago. They're different theses. Even I would argue for the wonderful John in the more traditional uh, thesis modes, they look a bit different. So the second variable to think about is with the regard to sound. Uh, sonic theses are important. So it can be used as footnotes, Maeve. They certainly can be used as footnotes. They can be used in your mitigating journal. They can be used in an appendix. There's no doubt about that. But what I would also say to you is because these are conversations, either you offering a testimony or you with your daughter, this, this is, yes, it can be evidence, but you've got to ask yourself evidence of what. So that's where the relationship between opinion and evidence, uh, information and knowledge, you need to actually work on that. So just because we've spoken, just because we've had a thought does not mean it's a good thought. So we've got to have some ranking and some judgment in there. And so Lorraine was straight in there. So we've got to actually work out, okay, the conversation took place. That's great. Why did the conversation take place? Where did it start? Where did it end? How did it enhance your significant original contribution to knowledge? So, so, cool. so for example, people can have journals, people can do blogs. We were talking about that, Doug, earlier this week. You can have all sorts of uh, proxies for your movement through the degree. And that's great. That's important as a sort of journal and journey through it. But you've then got to ask the question, that's great, that's me, that's me and my journey. How is that contributing to knowledge? Okay, and can I just extend that towards the podcasting? So the podcasts I have with you and with Jamie, mm -hmm. they sit as nitros, um, non-traditional research outputs, 
Um, and is there any other way that I can use them? They can be used as footnotes. Certainly our wonderful Sonny, who I supervise with uh, Steve, who did great work on African migrants in Australia, we podcasted through her thesis. I think they ended up being 54. And she used them as footnotes. Yeah, they were they were interesting potties, weren't they, Liam? And she she used them as footnotes to scaffold her argument, to demonstrate the movement between ideas. And in fact, it became a singly authored scholarly monograph and the podcast was still in there as footnotes, interestingly enough. So they, they can be used. But again, Maeve, you've just got to ask yourself, and this is the complicated, I suppose, issue for all of us to think about, is, is just because we've had a thought doesn't mean it's a good thought. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't mean that it's a, a scholarly thought. Doesn't, you know, it's an opinion. An opinion is great, but we live in an age where everybody's got a damn opinion. I mean, I've been I've been loving the Kate Middleton journey this week, Lee. And this is I've cried with laughter more than I thought I could at this age. It's been the funniest thing ever. But that's an example of I've I've got a thought bubble. Let me overshare that on Twitter, right? And millions of people have done that. Now that's great but that doesn't make it a PhD, Maeve. So ask yourself, is this sonic material a scaffolding to an argument and configure it as such? Is that helping a bit? Yeah, good. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Now, Darkster, just before we go to the... Oh, Liam, go, brother. That journey, that whole vibe of, of protecting a failing institution yeah. has been <laughs> it, 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 just, just astounding. Um, I, I've had an even weirder week. Um, so I met Banana Rama on Saturday. Oh, we are not Saturday. worthy. Look at Josh and I. Josh and I were straight there, mate. We're straight there. Like you, yeah. we love you, and then suddenly you are just beyond love. It's like, oh uh, no. I'm. I met Karen and Sarah, and we were talking about monograph projects. They've written a biography during lockdown, and I was like, oh, I'm trying to write a book too. And we're just like, oh, how's that going? We're at HMB in Manchester. I am doing a live signing. And we ended up speaking about book writing projects, which was just the weirdest experience. And, you know, I think they got the, the, the sense that I'm more Siobhan than Karen and Sarah. Um, you know, I left, checked out in 1988. But, um, yeah, that, that was a very weird twist of, yeah, the weekend um but yeah they, they they were offering advice about how to write a book to me which was which was interesting now look um, i can i can do every move of the venus video i can do it i'm happy to do it at any point you just start shelly and i in the corridor shell we'll start this we can do this video right so liam once more i just need to say i'm asking my question again why the hell am i not living in manchester so let me just ask that question once more why the hell am i not living in manchester and josh what the hell are we doing with our lives josh Josh, what the hell are we doing with our lives? Oh, like I have really lucid dreams that are pretty much exactly what you just described. <laughs> Amazing. This really happened. Like I've got photographic evidence if you follow me on Instagram. Like it's just, yeah. Oh, I've had, that's the funniest thing I think I've heard in this year so far. Thank you, Josh, for that. Right, so Liam, I'm just once more wondering, what am I doing with my life? Why have I not met Banana Rama? The closest I've come is Neil Tennant at London Victoria train station, and I never recovered. Never recovered, Liam. Oh, thanks for that level of excitement. It just doesn't compare with bloody Banana Rama. Thanks so much for that, Liam. I'm just hashtag no pressure. Now it's we've quite, sorry, it's a great song to leave on when we do leave. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. <laughs> Except I haven't got the pants anymore. Did you have the pants? I used to own the pants, Lorraine. I had the pants with the I had everything. I had everything. And then we do come on Eileen next week. Great. And now, Doug. For our last couple of minutes, let's just talk, and we can easily go, the sketch can see there's all the requests we've been given about dissemination, so they're staying on the desk. But Darkster's making some decisions about the possibility of podcasting, and you heard my comments with Maeve um, about the porous PhD and scaffolding the journey. How do you think you're going to use it, Darkster? I think I'll just have it as um, an appendix. And yeah. like nitros, like yeah, with the um, the, the chats with you and Jamie, I'll I'll just have them as an appendix, or near the end, I, I won't include, I won't embed them in the actual thesis itself. 
I, th I think that's a good idea too, because in that case, what Doug's has done, Josh, is it's configuring research integrity, right? So it's showing for examiners, sorry, John, showing for examiners the development of the ideas, the development of the argument. And it's also allowing you every week to reflect on it, Doug. So I think that's mm. that's great too. And, and so you're seeing it very much as a sort of small sonic experiment or a sonic lab. Yeah. yeah. There's now, nothing too extravagant. <laughs> Nothing too extravagant. So what do you need to make that happen, Dugster? Um I I think um well apart from Tuesday's Bloom session. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um I think we'll talk about whether I'll do fortnightly or monthly yes. um sessions. Probably monthly. Yeah. Um yep. to start with. Just to get because that by that time I would have had more readings done and developed my um ideas, my argument a lot lot better and stronger. And so Doug, how you're using it, mate, is that you're using it to scaffold the argument before you write it. That's a great yeah. piece of podcasting. Josh, any final comment to to Doug? I think that's quite a sound andragogical protocol there. Josh, any comments on that? I think it's great. Um one of the comments I got from my examiners, because I spoke a little bit about my PhD process and my introduction and how my um, you know approach to the research question changed and they wrote about the fact that they enjoyed that but they they also wished they could have more there so I think it's it's great to have that background for, for your examiners um, you know maybe it's not the most important part of actually configuring the thesis but to give your examiners that confidence mm. that it was you behind the whole thing is, yeah. is great I think yeah and of course Josh the point is of course in the medical sciences that research integrity confirmation is absolutely crucial. I love that. That was a bit of eyebrow work there, mate. Fantastic. And look, we'll, we'll finish for our last minute with beautiful Jess. Jess, who is managing the fencing neighbour. Now, are we are we moving forward, Jess, or are you still certain you're going to be running into that wall? Oh no, <laughs> I'm going to be fine. Oh, you're always you're always fine, but don't be so hard on yourself, Jess. You are exactly where you need to be, and you're terrific. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll get some work done in um, right club. Get some work done in right. My breaks. And Jess, you are exactly where you need to be. Lorraine is exactly where she needs to be. We will be dancing through the process, Lorraine colleagues. I will see many of you in right club. Glorious. Glorious morning. Uh, Liam, we all want to be you. I have to ask myself once more, why am I not in Manchester? Why am I not in Manchester? And I'll be carrying, yes, I know, Lorraine, why are we not in Manchester? And I'll be carrying that forward for the rest of my life. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, colleagues. See many of you in Right Club. Blessing. Sleep well, Liam. Sleep well, Donna. Lovely to see you, beautiful one. Bye-bye. Oh, dear comments. You're a star, John. You're a star, mate.